the masters in ai and data science uh, will be one of the flagship programs of the geo institute dr shailesh kumar who is one of our program mentors at geo institute for this program as well as the chief data scientist at geo his experience of creating ai based solutions comprises multiple domains including finance remote sensing retail conversational computing and computer vision along with doc dr larry he is also an architect of this symposium uh, may i please request dr shailesh to give his opening remarks uh, over to you sir hi thank you sanjay uh, good evening everyone good morning uh, good afternoon everyone uh, it's again a pleasure to see a lot of participation on day 3 uh, uh, you know it was a great talk that we just heard from john um, uh it was beautifully put together uh and obviously this is one of the one of the burning issues of the day and uh you know as as uh, they say in the movie spider man with great power comes great responsibility and ai is obviously one of the great powers that we have created and with that comes a great responsibility that we make our systems ethical and fair and unbiased so you know a lot of work going on in this area and you know we're going to have a special program on ethics in ai within the geo institute a whole stream of lectures and a course in that so um we are very excited today to have a very nice panel of of startups and you know let me kind of tie the idea of geo institute with the idea of startups and you know like larry said that in the beginning geo institute is going to run three different streams one is on the research area where our uh, students will advance the state of the art in research and learn about research methodology and create new innovations in ai and data science the second stream is going to be the modeling stream which is you know hands on industry scale data science um modeling production devops and all of that is the second stream and the third stream is going to be ai focused uh, social entrepreneurship if you will which is going to help us uh, create uh, you know new startups and 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 uh, new ways of thinking about an ai economy and because you know there is no discussion that is complete without uh, startups and since startup is at the heart of the geo institute we wanted to make sure that uh, we spend a whole day on uh, you know discussing about the role of startups in the ai economy and um, you know talk about how startup is going to be or entrepreneurship is going to be one of the three streams uh, as part of the geo institute so as part of the program we'll have two parts one is in the first part the three startups we have today naman is going to introduce them um, and uh, they are going to showcase uh, very quickly what they do and how they came about and after that we are going to join uh, the three founders as well as uh, two of our uh, distinguished panelists on the vc side to talk about the, the the journey of an ai startup if you will in in today's world yeah so uh, sunshine over to you please introduce the startups and uh, let them have uh, their demo and then after that we'll come back for the panel discussion sure yeah. sir thank you um So first up uh, we have Sean Barnes who is the co-founder and CEO of Outlier a company that empowers customers to optimize marketing programs track changes in buyer segments find product development issues and identify large patterns of fraud Recently Outlier was selected as the best AI based solution for marketing by AI Breakthrough a leading market intelligence organization Over to you Sean Excellent. It's great to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about Outlier. I will very quickly show you a demonstration of our platform. And I started the company 5 years ago based on a frustration I had about the world of data, which is we have many great tools for looking through data, analyzing data today, but they all focus on answering questions we know to ask. And often the hardest part with large data sets is knowing specifically what questions to ask in the first place. And this is the kind of problem where traditionally we've relied on humans, on human analysts, on human data scientists to look through data sets to find the unexpected opportunities, the unexpected problems hiding in those data sets. But as data scaled, that just hasn't scaled with it. We can't there's only so many hours in a day, so many people in the world, and we needed a better type of solution. And this is an application where I did my graduate research actually at Cornell in artificial intelligence. and i felt like there was a chance for a new approach that these new technologies were unlocking a new way of thinking about data analysis and that's what outlier does today we're a product that you connect to data 
to ask questions, to look for new kinds of patterns, things that traditional business intelligence tools or traditional data tools couldn't find for you. So let me show you exactly what I mean. So this is the Outlier product. You might have data in many different places. Sometimes it will be in cloud tools like Salesforce, uh, Google, Facebook. You connect those to the Outlier product with just one click. You just say, listen, this is my Facebook ads data. If I'm using, for example, Google Analytics, again, it's just one click. So the great news here is you can actually add all these myriad data sources that your business uses, the dozens of tools in just minutes, just through single clicks. We also support any sort of SQL compliant database. All you have to do is tell us how to connect to it. Again, it only takes minutes, unlike traditional data tools that can take weeks or months because you spend a lot of time telling it exactly what to look for, exactly how to look at the data, all those things that we're used to having to tell traditional types of software what to do. Outlier doesn't require that. It's using a lot of machine learning behind the scenes to automate all those different things. So after just connecting in a few minutes, what do I get in return? What does Outlier actually return to me? What I get is a constant stream of insights. Every day, Outlier generates a handful of key questions you should be asking. Questions that look like they were written by a human analyst. They include graphics that demonstrate what it found, context if I'm curious about drilling down to how it came to these sorts of conclusions. In this case, it's telling us how it analyzed this part of the business in terms of seasonality, cyclicality. It presents natural language description of exactly what's going on and also root cause analysis to tell us where should we look for what's going on? Why is this occurrence in the, in the business happening? Why is this pattern emerging? Why are these changes happening? And the great part is because Outlier isn't like a traditional software system. It's not relying on what I've told it. It's not relying on the structure given to it. It's using pure uh, numerica methods, um, about a dozen forms of machine learning across the board to build these automatically for us. So in, as a result, what I will learn in using Outlier is the unexpected, things that aren't subject to the bias that Dr. Kleinberg was just talking about. The ideas that I think I know what's important for my business aren't relevant here. Outlier is going to look through and find for you the key things that are changing. And there's dozens of forms of analysis it's doing simultaneously in an unsupervised manner to bring them to your attention. It can find relationships across systems, across metrics, across your business, things that you might not even have known were related in terms of your supply chain or your delivery, how your marketing results in uh, revenue. And so the diversity of insights it gives you really is something that was only possible now with using machine learning and AI techniques. It can also do data quality analysis. It can look through your data to tell you where honestly your data looks to be suspicious. It might not be accurate. It might not be trustworthy. Traditional BI tools, if you had data quality issues, it would just tell you incorrect metrics. It would tell you incorrect values. But this new generation of software of which Outlier is part of can be more intelligent than that. It can recognize these sorts of things. But even better, the Outlier system can also learn from watching humans, right? There's obvious question, how does a system like Outlier, which is software, how does it know what I find interesting? I, you saw in the integration, I didn't tell it what I care about. I didn't tell it what I find interesting. So how does it actually know what to show me? How does it know exactly what to choose out of the million things going on in my business, what to show me? And the answer is it learns by watching you in the same way that systems you know, learn by what products you buy, what other products recommend to you, or what movies I watch, what movies are recommend to me. Outlier watches humans interact with, with insights and has now for five years, which means that if, if a new customer adds their data to Outlier today, the insights they get tomorrow are gonna to be pretty good because there's a compounding network effect of learning where every time a user reads a story, we call these insight stories, Every time they drill down into it, Outlier is learning about what they find interesting in their data sets. And as a result, if there's a compounding effect that makes it better for everyone. But the best part about that is now, because all of that technology is working, but it's all behind the scenes, we didn't have to set it up. Again, it just took minutes to get up and running. You can actually now have people who don't have backgrounds in statistics. They don't have backgrounds in artificial intelligence. They don't have backgrounds in analytics start to use the power of these tools because the ease of use is so high because all the complexity is hidden behind the scenes. And so the average user of the outlier system today is, is a business user. They may never have used advanced analytics before. They certainly don't know much about statistics, but because it's so easy to integrate and because the insights that you get are so intuitive and easy to understand, it now has lowered the bar for adopting these tools and learning about data so much 
that it becomes an on-ramp for them for data-driven decision-making. And I think that's the promise of artificial intelligence in the world and why it's such a powerful force is things that used to be powerful, but only so much as the time you invested in them, now can become powerful on their own. And the fact that they're constantly learning means they can adapt to changes that previously would require you to go in and reset the whole system. So as, it, as the market changes, as these business changes happen, traditionally you'd have to go back into your, your dashboard and rebuild it with the new world. The, you know, the pandemic hits, the rules change, all of a sudden you come back in. With Outlier, since it's constantly adapting, you don't have to do that, it adapts with you. It's changing with you. It's almost like having a virtual data scientist sitting next to you all day looking through the data and bringing you these questions. The most exciting part for me though is since the outlier system is purely machine learning based and purely statistics based, we aren't governed by a specific vertical or specific use case. You can apply our system to any data source. In fact, what we've done recently is we've plugged it into all the global pandemic data to unravel and, and reveal interesting patterns that are erupting around the world, changes that are not obvious at the surface because there obviously are so many cities and so many places around the world, it's impossible to look through all of them. But a system like Outlier's job is to survey large amounts of data. And the power of this becomes clear when you start to realize we have enormous data sets that we just haven't used so far because the cost of looking through them on a manual basis was so amazingly high that it wasn't possible to penetrate them. That we could look through large data sets if we knew what we were looking for, but looking through large data sets if we didn't know what we were looking for it was impossible. And Outlier and this new generation of software, which is called automated business analysis, unlocks that for us, that now the size of the data doesn't matter. We can unlock these new tools and let them loose on these large data sets, and they will tell us if there's interesting insight. They will tell us what questions we should be asking. And that's gonna unlock an entire new generation of business decision makers and entirely new ways of running businesses that previously wasn't possible before. Uh, in closing, a quick short story. Five years ago when I was starting Outlier and describing what I thought our platform could do and the problems that I thought it could solve, people would look at me funny and, and they would say, listen, Sean, that sounds great, but it's science fiction. There's no way that computers could analyze data at that scale. There's no way uh, computers could analyze my business and tell me things I don't know. And today, five years later, this has become the fastest growing segment of the business intelligence community. In just five years, it's gone from seeming like science fiction and people not believing it could work to people not only believing it does work, but believing they need to have it as part of their business today. And so our customers include a growing portion of the Fortune 500. We have customers around the world at this point. This is becoming the future and it happens so quickly because it's so compelling, because you can start using Outlier in minutes and see the value for yourself. You don't have to wait months. You don't have to wait quarters. You can actually start to deploy Outlier today and have insights tomorrow. And that's exciting for me. I think this will touch more industries, but this is what we do here at Outlier. And I appreciate the chance to show you what we do. Thank you, Sean. Um, our, next start our next startup is Haptic, a company that aims to upgrade customer experiences through intelligent virtual assistance, thus driving ROI at every stage. Recently, Haptic, along with MyGOV, won the Best Innovation for COVID-19 Award at the COGEX 2020, a prestigious AI leadership summit. May I please request uh, Akrit Vesh, CEO and co-founder of Haptic, to tell us more. Over to you, Akrit. Thanks, Anjay. And, uh, hi, everybody. This is uh, Akrit Vesh, co-founder and CEO of uh, uh, Haptic. Uh, thanks for having me over here today and uh, uh, letting, uh, letting me share our story. Uh, so Haptic is a conversational AI platform. We make intelligent virtual agents. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I think uh, uh, everybody associates uh, uh, us or for that matter, a company like us is chatbots or voice bots. Yes, uh, we do build... Uh, uh, we do build uh, uh, chatbots or voice-driven assistants. But one of the things I wanted to highlight, and the immediate next question we typically get asked is, uh, what is different about uh, Haptic compared to a lot of other uh, uh, similar companies out there? Uh, and this is usually what I like to show. This is the journey that uh, uh, you know both the industry and we have taken as a company uh, over a period of the last seven years, uh, which is uh, essentially... Uh, you know, when initially chatbots first uh, were launched, uh, they were a lot about uh, uh, automating uh, basic FAQs, one-way questions, right? So you ask a question, it gets an answer. Uh, over a period of time, uh, we moved to uh, 
uh, decision trees and chat flows. So you could basically put what is typically referred to as if then tree structures such that there's multi turn question answers actually uh, happening. After that, we moved into uh, being able to integrate these with uh, third party systems such that you can pull uh, real time customer data um, and be able to solve queries uh, to a certain degree end to end. Um, the way we have evolved and we as in Haptic has evolved over the last uh, one and a half, two years particularly, and why we like to think of uh, uh, our product as being uh, as being intelligent genuinely to solve uh, customers' questions is because uh, of the deep domain knowledge that we've established. Um, so uh, essentially, instead of having uh, one specific AI engine or natural language engine, uh, that works across any type of uh, uh, interaction. What we've done is we've built vertical domain industry specific uh, capabilities such that uh, when you uh, know in a in a, in a in a telecom scenario, when you're having a two way conversation, it understands the nuances of, let's say, a telco versus, let's say, when you're having it in travel. The favorite example I always like to use is that the meaning of the word plan can be very different when you're uh, talking about it, it within telco versus when you're talking about it within uh, travel. The meaning of the word order can have seven different meanings depending upon the context and domain you're in. So because of our experience over the years, the data sets we've collected over a period of time um, and a lot of work we've done in this area, we've now been able to figure out uh, AI models by domain uh, which we see in genuinely uh, help us uh, improve the end customer experience. I wanted to show you one thing very quickly, which actually, um, you know, it's not even public yet, uh, but I can, I, can, I wanted to uh, show the direction we're headed in. Um, if you think about this, right, we have now created our own, um, you know, you can call it bots, so you can call it skills library based on different verticals. And each one of these um, skills or bots that you see over here is already preset with the training data, um, the libraries, as well as the systems required to make it successful. Uh, so if you see within e-commerce, you know, things like payment failure, cancel order, track order, request for invoice copy, check refund status. If I was to go to financial services, you'll see within over here, uh, you know, we've broken it down further into lending and insurance because we realized that Financial services itself is very vast and you need to further uh, break it down. So within lending, you can see some of the typical things that people do. Uh, and, you know, if I click on any one of them, let me just see, okay, mortgage rates, what happens? You'll actually see over here kind of end to end how this uh, specific skill uh, will actually work, what you can do, what is the uh, engine behind the skill. You can also actually see a quick demo over here as well as the specific APIs and systems needed to make the skill happen end to end. Think about this is almost like literally years of work going into setting up something that is literally pre-built and our customers can start using immediately. Um, I'll quickly move into uh, a demo of how all of this happens. Uh, this is our demo environment right now, which is showing you, um, you know, in the retail, retail uh, uh, context, uh, an actual virtual assistant. Uh, so this is our product. So if you click over here, this is basically, um, you know, it shows Ali, which is a virtual agent that is online. Uh, we typically start with some sort of uh, a guide because uh, we often see that people want to have a starting point. That said, let's say if I start typing, you will see that there's a bunch of auto suggested questions that show up. Uh, this is again, all available in the system. You don't need to retrain these models if you are a retailer or e-commerce company. So let's say I can do where is my order. Um, it will come back saying I need your 10 digit mobile number. I'm going to enter this mobile number right here that you see on the demo screen. Uh, we have simple modules like two factor authentication already built into the platform. Um, so let's say I put my mobile number and then it's asking me for a two factor verification code. Um, you know, so I can just do this. It'll now show me, you know, my current outstanding orders after it's been verified. Um, and, you know, this has now become commonplace where we have a lot of these uh, uh, smart design elements where essentially, um, you know, you can you can customize the way and the way the carousals look, the number of buttons, the, uh, you know, even the information on them. Um, I'm going to show you, you know, this this seems like fairly simple stuff. 
uh, but I'll show you some some stuff that uh, you know we've built recently that I'm very proud of. Um, so I'm going to type something that is a uh, uh, that is slightly complicated as a statement. So uh, this is a feature that we built very recently. Where typically what happens is when you when 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 users or customers end up typing complex statements, most virtual agent platforms in the world don't understand what is going on. What we try and do is we try and narrow the problem down. Um, so as you can see, the response over here says this can be interpreted in different forms. Which one of these did you actually mean to say? Uh, so this actually is taking in understanding multiple intents within the same statement. Uh, and actually narrowing the narrowing the options down for the customer um, till about nine or twelve months back, complicated long statements like these, um, you know, us or for that matter, a lot of other uh, systems may not have been able to interpret. Um, you know, we build some small things like this where we have a location picker built in. Um, I can do confirm location and it'll show up the nearest stores. Um, and finally, the last one feature I want to show before I show one more thing is. Uh, uh, something that I'm very proud of. Uh, we learned that uh, most people in the world uh, uh, struggle to spell correctly, including myself. Uh, so we actually built, uh, 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 you know, sort of the, a spell checker. Uh, I just completely made the mess. But as you can see, uh, I could type uh, I could type things that may not make sense. Uh, but we built basically a phonetic spell checker, which actually understands, uh, you know, some of the a meaning behind the words and tries to find find the right answer for it. Um, uh, I think we're almost out of time, but I wanted to show one more thing, which is some of the in in today's times, uh, possibly the uh, proudest uh, work that we've done uh, in our lifetime. Um, you know, we built uh, a helpline on WhatsApp uh, during the COVID times uh, for uh, uh, for which was the which became the official. COVID helpline for the country promoted by our prime minister's office. It's called MyGov Corona Help Desk. Uh, it has been used by about 40 million citizens since COVID happened. Um, you know, um, I'll start over here. It basically uh, gives me uh, all the information I need regarding COVID and how to stay safe in India, along with all the relevant uh, information. Uh, this is currently in Hindi. I can also switch it to English. Um, and it works in both languages. Um, and you will see that basically different things that I can do. I can say what are my sim what are symptoms. Again, if you notice, I spell symptoms incorrectly purposely, uh, and you'll see it basically shows up saying what are the different symptoms of coronavirus. Um, you know, I, I can I can basically say where do I get tested. And it'll give me all the different information I need, uh, which are all the different helpline numbers or all of the different information to get tested. So uh, this has been the one of, the, like I said, the most impactful pieces of work that Haptic has done ever. Um, so I just wanted to quickly show this and, and hand over back to uh, uh, whoever's next. Thank you, Akri. That was uh, really interesting to watch. Uh, next up, we have Aditi Avasti, who is the founder and CEO of Imbibe. Uh, an edtech company whose vision is to deliver holistic learning solutions to students, regardless of their ability, exposure, and access. Uh, in 2019, Aditi won uh, the Innovator of the Year Award at the ET Prime Women Leadership Summit. Over to you, Aditi. All right. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here and also to be amongst friends. Um, you know, so uh, actually today is Imbibe's eighth birthday, so I'm very excited to be here. And I'm um, actually in our uh, new office. We started working from home and I'm working from the office and here's my mask. Um, so I'm very keen to talk to you guys about, you know, how we've used artificial intelligence to create a platform to personalize education. So it's not just one use case. It's a plethora of use cases. And it started with a very simple principle that if you have no teacher in the room, and if you have nothing available, because even today, 30 to 80 percent of students don't actually have teachers in the classroom, let alone qualified teachers. How do you use technology to help a student empirically improve and not just use a simple, you know, vanilla uh, use case like 
consuming learning or consuming practicing and consuming testing. So this problem statement of creating the perfect teacher is a platform problem. It's not a product problem. So what I want to do is I want to, um, you know, just show you guys like a small little teaser video that will give you a sense of the range of the problems that we're working on. And then I'm going to take about maybe, you know, 10, 15 seconds um, and sort of bring it all and bind it into context and then sort of take it from there. So I'm just going to share my screen. So here's the video. So this is the new logo. You know, we're still in stealth. We're coming out very soon with the combined thing and it stands for personalization. I'm going to just provide running commentary in the background. So the first thing is first, right? An ed tech product has to be about education. So we've gone with an OTT narrative so that students find it extremely engaging and it's a 360 degree student experience. But more than building learn, practice, and test, we've actually built a very powerful experience called Achieve, which actually helps a, every single student achieve their dream score or dream goal and you know, all of that, whatever they wish to do in life. This is powered by what we call you know, a learning graph for education. So this particular thing actually takes your curriculum from first to 12th standard and knits it together to understand how learning is fundamentally connected. Because you know, when we were doing this whole teacher emulation exercise, we realized that any teacher in any classroom is always limited by the finite boundaries of the curriculum of that classroom. So when a child is struggling, and you know, and in education, we heard this problem again and again and again, that you know, how do you kind of fix what was left behind? So how do you get a student to perform at grade level? The question is, how do you traverse back? Because it's so far been a one-way street forward. So what we did was we took this challenge about six years ago. We started building a manually calibrated ontology, which was simply successors and predecessors, to understand how linkages happen. Then this was broken down to concept level, because as we all know, all AI starts with expert tagging, right? Um, so it started at the concept level and then, you know, I mean, at the chapter level and then came to the topic level, then came to the concept level, then came to the competency level. And, and then what we realized is when you take a step back and you look at all the subjects across all the grades, it's actually, you know, as overwhelming and interestingly interconnected as a galaxy. So what we also empirically realized is that actually your school education is linked to your future life success, which is the entrance exam system which we don't endorse, but this is how the world works right now. And it's very, very important that a child should have a no regret standard for consumption so they can go back and fix anything. So the other thing that was very interesting, there are many, many aspects of uh, you know, this graph. As you can see, there are a bunch of relationships You know that I just want to take it back a little bit. The reason why I made a video was because I thought there was so much to show to sort of be an efficient use of time. Um, so if you see here, you have attributional ontology, you have peer relationships, and you also have relationship types. So you have academic sequence and a bunch of things. And over a period of time, this graph has grown from entirely manually calibrated to largely data derived. Okay. And what's interesting is that you know there are many, many use cases that are derived from this. So if you look at the learning sequence point, this particular thing is giving you the learning sequence down to the concept level where it is connecting these, these small little white triangles are connecting our connected competencies at a concept level learning sequence, not just at a syllabus level, okay? So this learning sequence, you know, we take together and, you know, we run about 20 million parameters on one kid to give a personalized achievement journey that you saw in the product there. The other thing is, I view my content as how it is tagged and expressed in the graph. So one of the main problems then becomes that how do you multiply the amount of content available at each node? Because personalization is deeply linked to you know, what you have available, because obviously, you know, there are so many types of students you're profiling there. And then you have so many, um, you know, types of uh, content that are available. And if you personalize, you match the two and you craft feedback loops that actually move the entire system and learning outcomes forward. So unless you can do that, I mean, the point is, you know, it's not really fun because you're just creating a transactional journey. And, uh, you know, that's not what real impact looks like. 
So, you know, let me just sort of move forward and show you guys the next thing. So the next problem was how do you kind of, you know, curate and package content with AI? Because I was like, all right, I'm going to keep classifying and classifying and classifying. And we're going to use sensor thinking as a fundamental premise to keep understanding the student. And we're going to over invest in learning more and more about every child's interaction with learning, practicing and testing. Right. So I said, all right, so how, what does it take to build all the curriculums of the world? Right. First is you have a common data denominator, which is the knowledge graph, which show which stores information at a concept and a competency level. But the next thing to do from there is to figure out how do you you know, adapt it to multiple uh, curriculums, which becomes just a labeling problem. But then the question is, if you're making it so granular, how do you classify all the content you have available to that? So we said, all right, you know, let's try and actually use AI and natural language. And this is kind of like a snapshot from our platform. So you can actually see how many different, you know, APIs and things that we have running at one point. So, so you know, we actually went and said, we are not going to settle even for a learning experience that doesn't allow me calibration. So if you look at this, this is a platform that we invested in. There is a VR streaming happening in the background. And if you look at these two, you know, the forward and backward uh, arrows, it's actually converted the entire learning experience to a frame by frame thing where you can look at the drop off rate at a frame by frame level. So we were applying sort of sensor training and also allowing engagement within the learning experience because we said we just simply cannot calibrate a student or, or uh, you know, or, or the effectiveness of the learning item unless we understand what the feedback loop looks like. Okay, so so I think you know everybody talks about CAT, right? Cost of acquisition of a customer. I have this cost of acquisition of data that we've invested in. It's our eighth birthday. We're finally coming out with our dream product, you know, with the platform and everything behind us. And I've been so excited to have Geo as partners because we always get pushed to actually deliver end, you know, student impact. And for student and impact is just make me, you know, a better learner, make me, you know, achieve better things, right? So, um, so, you know, so this is now coming out and I think that for us, the big thing is cost of data acquisition. So I think we've been very mature in our journey to actually craft the data pipeline for Imbibe. So we went deep, you know, using test prep to understand what kind of signals actually improve a student. We filed a bunch of patents on it. Then we said, how do you reconstruct that model from K-12? We needed domain data. We acquired companies to do that. How do you extend it forward to advanced test prep? you know, pre post grad, we bought their data, we recalibrated their models. And then we understood, you know, how do you kind of bring it all together. So so the point is that you cannot not sort of, you know, invest in data collection. And it's a rite of passage to go from pure product to platform. And I think one thing that I'm proud of in our journey as in Bible is that we've stayed very, very consistent to our theme of information is power, context is power, Content is everywhere. So how do you add context to the consumption? How do you create feedback loops in such a way? And how do you bring down the overall cost of content creation? Because you're going so deep into personalizing that, you know, the student ends up improving significantly. Show you one other interesting thing around content calibration. This is smart tagging. So if you see here, you know, there is a question set. By the way, we also invest. So a very fast way to launch product is just publish images, right? But if images are not crawlable, I want to make every single piece of content re machine readable. So if you see how what's happened is we took a set of questions, we've smart tagged their subject, their chapter, and all of this requires data. So this is how we put sort of our data reuse. And it's not just something that, you know, you only have the smart tagging happening. You also want to make sure that you're constantly validating what is going on. So we have a platform as a service experience where Many, many institutions upload their data. They have an interface where they can go and look at the smart tagging and they can actually correct it. So we constantly collect training data through our products that are given to the end user. And what's very interesting is that a lot of AI companies have SaaS, but they are dependent on you know, institutional data to run that SaaS experience. For us, what we did was we basically had consumer data, so which is why I keep talking about the cost of data acquisition, right? We had a consumer platform. We committed to making it free to collect enough data to build our models. Now, when we are standing there, we actually had calibrated models with intelligently tagged content that pushed us ahead, even in the SaaS game, in terms of intelligence. Another example, everybody talks about this. How do you take a handwritten image and how do you solve it? So this is like an OCR demo with like a solver technology baked into it. So if you see here, somebody uploaded right multiples of six, and the question got solved, not just solved, it gets solved step by step. And you can also generate questions 
you know, um, infinite questions of this kind using that. This is automated test generation. We just published a paper on educational data mining on this. We've written genetic algorithms to generate tests. The national regulator of the country uses our platform, you know, to, um, to publish their papers in the, you know, the practice app that they have created. So this is something like, again, you know, we're not very much in public domain in terms of all of the stuff that we're doing, but, you know, uh, trust me, like 1.6 million students have used, you know, us just through one platform as a service partner. And given the intelligent content as a service combined with the quality of the algorithms, it's led to business models which are mind bending because people want to go the distance to partner with us, given the amount of value we are able to add at the price that we are able to add it. So crafting personalized achievement journeys, I just wanted to show you, this is basically an, you know, like an API curl, but you saw achieve in the beginning. So what this is doing is it's taking all the data, the knowledge graph tags and everything else, and it's actually generating a custom learning path for the user. What's interesting about this, right, is that um, it's, it's not only doing this from a, um, you know, sorry, it's not only doing this from a, um, you know, from, from just from a one student standpoint, it's doing this for every single kid. In terms of impact, you know, we've had over half a billion hours of engagement. We've touched about 250 million students so far. And now we're very, very excited to come out with our full K-12 launch. So, so yeah, so this is uh, just a little bit of a snapshot around what AI and education can do and what AI and education is all about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi.